So please join me in welcome uh, our moderator of the second panel, um, Anna Miliaki. She's an assistant uh, professor of architecture at the MIT. Um, Anna? Hello, take your seats. We're entering a, a red panel. All right, I want to, since I'm no longer a native, I now want to, you know, tell you that it's a great pleasure for me to uh, take on the moderation of this panel. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, architecture and state team for coming up with the topic, as I think it allows us to uh, take a fresh look at the post-war uh, and cross some of the common discursive divides that generally reproduce the political divides of the Cold War. Uh, and I know that, you know, just, just uh, before me, Reinhold uh, suggested that, you know, post-war is uh, maybe not the most important topic to connect to the architecture and state, and that may be true, but what I think is interesting is that in reverse, the attaching architecture and the state to a post-war topic actually uh, does open up something really interesting. Um, and so, just in uh, this last year of acting as a moderator, uh, in various history theory panels, now encountered more of a critical mass uh, of people working on what I've been insisting on calling uh, second world topics than in the entire eight years of my writing on a second world topic. And I don't know if this is just a factor of sort of having felt particularly lonely in the, the writing process or something really is uh, changing. Now, when it comes to uh, the topics you're gonna see here, uh, that the state was one of the most important agents in the second world production of architecture uh, is a truism with the capacity to prevent us from actually understanding the mechanisms and practices that constitute the history of the second world and uh, in general and its architectural history uh, specifically. And I want to in a way call back something uh, here from the outset that actually Ijlal said really eloquently uh, yesterday, a kind of Althusserian caution that uh, the state is not a thing and it doesn't have a center even when uh, its uh, bureaucratic and ideological apparatuses are centrally organized. Um, that is, even when you know, uh, it employs all of the architects that uh, operate on its geographic territory. Now, and you know, I'm gonna set out a few things that are, for me, interesting about these topics. So uh, they're self, it's a self-serving uh, framework for the panel. Uh, but I like holding on to the notion of the second world, even though that's not a term that's uh, been consistently used to describe this geopolitical uh, uh, context that we're going to deal with in all the papers. Uh, but I like holding on to it because it highlights the real structural, that is economic, discursive, and even cultural difference from the first and the third worlds, and, uh, which and that difference inevitably constitutes the products in the, uh, of the second world. Uh, while it simultaneously highlights uh, to me the fact that we have not yet developed a real interpretive framework uh, that is specific to that difference, the second world. And by this, uh, I mean to say not that, you know, that even basically as each historian of the second world material may have developed in their own work an attitude and even a theory about what it means to do history or write history of these artifacts, we don't have enough of a public discussion about uh, methodological and interpretive specificity of this context. Now, so as, as I'm happy that uh, we have a, a conference that allows us to across the, the political boundaries that generally divide the discourse. I'm also happy that we actually have a panel that's going to concentrate on some of the issues that are going to be specific to the second world. Um, and so, but on the other hand, so if we in fact have a critical mass now, which I'm saying, I'm feeling, then maybe we don't need a general theory of second world history, but this is something that I would like to talk about in the conversation afterwards. So the range of topics in this panel 
uh, maps historically across the Stalinist era and the thaw. And indeed, each of the papers will take up, among other things, the issue that was suggested in the title of the panel of Second World's Architects' inevitable task of interpreting and delivering a social agenda through design. Uh, but there are other things. So that could be maybe the point one of our general theory of Second World uh, history. But so the, I will just introduce the speakers all now in advance, and I'm not going to come out to uh, introduce you before, uh, before each paper. But the first speaker is Greg Castillo, and his paper is, or let me tell you who he is, is the Associate Professor at the College of Environmental Design, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and he will be telling us about reconstructing German cities and citizens. Uh, Ala Vronskaya, uh, who is a doctoral candidate in history theory and criticism at MIT. Uh, her project or her paper will be on people's parks in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, Richard Anderson, who is a doctoral candidate, a few days away from being just uh, uh, finished, uh, in the history of architecture at the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia. And he will be telling us about an, ex an experimental project in uh, Moscow, and the paper is called A New Way of Life. So please take over. Thank you. Cold War Berlin was an unparalleled laboratory for the interaction of states and architecture. There, two alternative cities of industrial modernity arose side by side from the rubble of Hitler's Germany. Divided Berlin demonstrates that there were two post-war international styles, the neoclassicism of a Soviet imperium and the American-influenced modernism of the Marshall Plan and NATO. In East Berlin, socialist reali the socialist realist Stalin Allee, which you see on the left, was a byproduct of a Stalinist economy and its urban planning. In West Berlin, the Hansa Viertel residential district on the right, built for the International Housing Exposition of 1957, or Interbau for short, made transnational consumer capitalism at home in West Germany through international style modernism. Interbau's apartment block by Gropius and the Architects Collaborative is perhaps the perfect symbol for an imagined community conjoining the Weimar Republic of the 20s and the Federal Republic of the 50s, the two, quote, good Germanys championed by post-war America. Socialist realism and international style modernism were far more significant than mere branding devices for the cultural division of Germany. Cold War reconstruction mobilized opposing programs for social and human reform explicitly intended to re-educate former Third Reich citizens. Competing architectures of state were infrastructures for competing post-war subjectivities. The worker activist heroized on the, on the left in a poster for East Berlin's socialist reconstruction, and the Marshall Plan consumer citizen glamorized on the right in a fashion spread shot on location at West Berlin's Interbau. These human and urban reconstruction efforts are the focus of my research, which asserts as its fundamental premise that the objects and subjects shown here are so intertwined, even symbiotic, that their histories must be written in tandem. One of these programs, uh, the one on the left, seems obviously state-managed, while that on the right, represented by symbols of consumer choice, often evades analysis as an architecture of state. I take on this misconception in a new monograph, Cold War on the Home Front. It examines the State Department's use of suburban model homes to pitch the benefits of free trade and to undercut the appeal of communism in post-war Europe. At the 1952 show, We're Building a Better Life, shown on the left, visitors examined human subjects making use of modernist furnishings manufactured in Marshall Plan member states. A press release explained, quote, just as these items from the various countries combine to form a homogeneous whole, so the nations themselves can combine to form a homogeneous community. West Berlin's Better Life Home drew, uh, exhibition drew crowds from both West and East Germany, 
Remember that until the infamous wall was built in 1961, divided Berlin was an open city where citizens could simply walk across the Cold War's geopolitical divide. American home propaganda efforts in West Berlin paved the way for the 1959 Nixon Khrushchev debate in Moscow, at which a sunshine yellow GE kitchen came to embody the clash of Cold War civilizations, the trajectory chronicled in Cold War on the Home Front. That ends our product placement. So let's return to the topic at hand, socialist realism and its civilizing mission. According to East German party leader Walter Ulbricht, the westward emigration of Bauhaus, former Bauhaus masters revealed the true politics of modernism. And I quote, today, where are the architects who represented the Bauhaus, such as Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and others? They are in America. They seem to like it there. And from this, we can infer that they have decided in favor of American imperialism, end quote. The East German Politburo declared war on modernism in 1951. The party newspaper Neues Deutschland proclaimed that, quote, in architecture, what hinders us most is the underlying functionalist philosophy of many East German architects. The party condemned international style modernism as a plot to, quote, disassociate the people from their native land, language, and culture so that they adopt the American lifestyle and join in the slavery of American imperialism, end quote. The same point was made by comparing the new US-funded Free University in West Berlin with the architecture of a bank headquarters, seen below it, in the publication, National Reconstruction and the Task of a New German Architecture. Socialist realist design required a, quote, connection to past exemplars, specifically to the legacy of Prussian neoclassicism in East Germany, rather than the Bauhaus influences of the West's international style, which was, of course, another connection to past exemplars, one that just happened to be despised by the party. Inculcating an appreciation for beauty and its political ideology comprised an important mission of East Germany's Erziehungsdiktatur, or educative dictatorship, as the regime has recently been described. Ulbricht, the party boss, maintained that members of the intelligentsia who failed to grasp the fundamentals of beauty demonstrated their alienation from the working class. And as the East German architect Hans Hopp explained, quote, we know that political consciousness is, for many, not sufficiently developed to be, to be able to enable citizens to distinguish beautiful and good from ugly and bad. Only when such material education penetrates the citizen's innermost being, including the world of his dreams and fantasies, will changes bear fruit." End quote. In short, socialist realist beauty defined the beholder making beauty an architectural term as loaded with portent as function was for modernists. The result was a national reconstruction policy in which the creation of environments saturated with beauty assumed strategic importance in the project to forge socialist citizens. The process and products of socialist realist reconstruction yielded a bumper crop of post-war subjectivities from culturally enlightened apartment dwellers to heroic construction workers. Even party secretary Ulbricht was cast or recast as, quote, the master builder of socialism. Rather than surveying these multiple personalities, I'll focus this presentation on a professional reclamation project, that is, the transformation of former East German modernists into a fresh cohort of neoclassicists. The Deutsche Bauakademie, a design bureaucracy modeled on a Soviet Academy of Architects, was founded in 1951 to promote the gospel, of, the gospel of socialist realism in East Germany. The new organization claimed the bombed ruin of Schinkel's historic Bauakademie in Berlin as its future headquarters. Socialist realism approached neoclassicism similarly as an entitlement to be expropriated from its former bourgeois masters, just as with other forms of property. As elucidated in the Balcademy journal, quote, Comrade Stalin, following the precepts of Lenin, 
has determined that it is not possible to build communism without appropriating the knowledge and cultural legacy of all human history, including the artistic heritage, end quote. In contrast to socialist neoclassicism, Bauhaus design and its international style descendant were said to be capitalist phenomenon. And this news came as a shock to former Weimar modernists like Bau Academy associate Hans Hopp, uh, who quoted, who noted that, quote, the accusations made against the Bauhaus then must be made against all architects who are products of this time. East German modernists had become, by definition, enemies of the new socialist state. As a man with an architecturally deviant past, uh, Hans Hopp played a crucial role in reorienting East Germany's former modernists. Born in 1890, Hopp was classically trained, but joined the modernist camp in the mid-1920s, as proclaimed in the strip windows and curved corner of his 1928 cinema in Königsberg, which you see on the top right. His practice collapsed during the Depression, and in 1939, he enter, entered German military service for a second time, already as quite a mature man. At war's end, he migrated to Dresden, where he drafted a plan for the city's reconstruction based on the Cartesian forms and Cartesian logic of Le Corbusier's 1933 Ville Radius, as seen on the lower right. Like many other politically galvanized East German architects, Hopp had believed that the new socialist Germany would pick up where interwar modernism left off. He, loc he relocated to East Berlin in 1950 for post in the East German Ministry of Construction in the same year that a team of its bureaucrats headed off for retraining at the Union of Soviet Architects in Moscow. Hopp became a member of the Bau Academy in 1951. His award-winning design that year for the Max Hütte House of Culture in Unterwellenborn displayed his conversion to socialist realism, both as a designer and as a newly minted member of a Stalinist intelligentsia. As an instant authority on the new socialist architecture, Hopp bemoaned the fact that so few of his colleagues could design, quote, beautiful details that come together harmonically in a beautiful whole, end quote. This handicap, he said, revealed the pervasive effect of American cultural barbarization. Because, quote, all that is truly new is developed out of the old, end quote, only a return to German tradition could resolve this aesthetic and ideological crisis. Hopp's Max Hütte House of Culture blazed a trail to achieving the party's mandate for a new German architecture. Its preliminary drafts were published as a lesson in how architects might overcome modernist deviance. This paper trail of design development, progressing from modernism to neoclassicism, is absolutely unique in post-war architecture. The immediate prototype for the East German House of Culture was the Soviet Workers Club, an institution charged with transforming laborers into the new men and women of communism. Typically attached to an industrial facility, the Soviet Workers Club advanced the party's occupation of everyday life within a Stalinist com company town infrastructure. In 1950, East Germany's Politburo proposed the construction of a facility, quote, based on the model of a Soviet House of Culture for workers at the Max Hütte steel mill in Unterwellenborn. And as with any other commission of national consequence, it was awarded to the Deutsche Bauakademie, where it was routed to Hopp's Atelier. Working with associate Joseph, uh, Josef Kaiser, Hopp produced a design that achieved canonic status as a monument to the nation's five-year plan. And you see it on the right in a five-year plan uh, economic poster celebrating it as uh, a uh, example of Lenin's uh, saying, art belongs to the people. Constructed from 1952 to 1955, the finished building included uh, performance, rehearsal, and exhibit halls, game rooms, offices, a cafe, youth club, and library. A gabled block containing the 1,200-seat auditorium and its grand foyer provided a dominant central element for a sprawling cross-axial composition. Flanked by projecting gabled wings, the monumental portico, framed by smaller brackets, evoked the Brandenburg Gate, the heraldic symbol that graced the Bau Academy seal, as shown on the left. 
An article in the professional journal Planen und Bauen provided a behind the scenes look at the process by which the architect's initial proposal in the detested modernist style evolved into a socialist realist masterpiece. The essay begins by repudiating the notion of artistic creativity as a bourgeois fantasy. Quote, with regard to the architect's profession, when we increasingly speak about planning rather than designing, our living language unconsciously registers a transformation of method. This change expresses the fact that an, increasingly, an increasing proportion of this occupation's creative work no longer follows an intuitive flash in its realization, but, uh, but proceeds from logical thought processes developed within an awakened consciousness." End quote. The rhetoric may have echoed interwar functionalism, but its outcome was quite the opposite. Four consecutive design schemes for the House of Culture illustrated this appeal to socialist realist rationalism. An initial proposal joined a trapezoidal auditorium to an orthogonal block uh, via a curving glass gallery, which you see, of course, on the left. Its rhythmic forms evoke the feel of Oscar Niemeyer's Brazilian work of the 1940s, uh, early 1940s, which you see on the right. And I need to uh, uh, note that uh, Hopp's article did not mention any architectural precedents, so these comparisons, which you'll see on the right, are all, always mine. Uh, the design team rejected this approach, which was said by them to express, quote, cheerfulness rather than monumentality. This was a benign verdict indeed, given the fact that the party's denunciation of modernism uh, made this a form of aesthetic and ideological subversion. A second attempt, presented in a perspective drawing at the top, showed hip-roofed blocks arrayed asymmetrically around a courtyard and rendered them in a stern Teutonic vernacular. The scheme is uh, uncomfortably reminiscent of Third Reich design, as ev evidenced when compared to a public building built in Nuremberg during Hitler's rule. The team's third proposal looked to an even more distant generation of German architecture for inspiration. Agglomerating much of the building's program beneath a single gable roof framed by rows of engaged pilasters and arches, the third perspective design recapitulates the wall treatments of Hans Polzig's uh, Grosses Schauspielhaus of 1919 in Berlin. These proposals were said to illustrate the team's progress uh, for the final design of the Max, uh, Max Hütte House of Culture, a final design that was progressing toward this symmetrical massing framed by uh, uh, forward thrusting wings. Now, Western heretics would likely interpret this design process as an archeological dig through a succession of architectural non sequiturs, beginning with mid-century modernism, descending through the subsequent strata of Third Reich Heimatschutz and then interwar expressionism, and finally hitting pay dirt by an unearthing Prussian neoclassicism, which uh, after all was really the foregone conclusion of Hopp's design process. While such an explanation might satisfy Western Cold Warriors, it is fundamentally ahistorical, ignoring rather than revealing the role played by ideology in cultivating architecture's socialist realist intelligentsia. A far different interpretation emerges when we consider Hopp's account intended for the enlightenment of former modernists in the context of East Germany's Erziehungsdiktatur, or educative dictatorship. As historian Greg Agegian notes, quote, the East German citizen of the 1950s was understood in cognitive terms as a subject who required education, rearing, and consciousness raising and needed to be protected from dangerous diversions and detours." End quote. In Hopp's article, the emphasis on planned logic rather than unpredictable inspiration attempts to, fledge, uh, to protect fledgling socialist realists from their own devi uh, uh, deviationist dangers. In fact, Hopp and Kaiser's approach to socialist realist architecture strongly resembled East Germany's, quote, new method of art education for children presented in the context there of socialist school reform. 
According to a 1950 article in the pedagogical journal Die Neue Schule, the idea that, quote, gifted children had a, quote, special talent for art was a pernicious legacy of bourgeois education which had cultivated grade school elites. Quote, drawing, painting, sculpture, and building, and working are things that can be taught and learned. Not only technique, but also content can be imparted. Content, in fact, was the key to primary school art ed education, according to proponents of the new approach. Quote, just as we demand healthy realism in every work of art, so also in children's art is form determined by the priority of content. What, co what content is obligatory? In teaching, as befits our German democracy, social content, which stirs the entire nation, must predominate. Shepherding children from primitive dabbling to the realistic depiction of socialist themes like man and his work constituted, quote, the developmental process of drawing. The Neue Schule article illustrated this process with a developmental timeline of children's drawings. The sequence begins with uh, scribbles and then uh, proceeds to a lumpy proto-torso and also a spiral with a line indicating a speeding car. Drawings then come to mimic forms found in nature. Uh, then, as the child matures, succeed in depicting human movement, uh, body parts and body forms. Uh, and uh, finally, the process is, uh, comes to an end, it comes to a conclusion uh, in this article with an image uh, from an eighth grader's uh, drawing project. So the culmination of this developmental process in which representational accuracy was the measure both of aesthetic skills and proper socialization was illustrated by an eighth grader's drawing assignment on the theme, Industrial and Farm Workers. According to socialist realist child pedagogy, one could detect the promise of an awakened political consciousness even in a toddler's scrawl since it contained the living kernel of uh, what educators called, quote, healthy realism. Hopp was similarly able to discern the promise of realist form lying dormant within an abstract modernist diagram. The notion that architectural ontogeny recapitulated the phylogeny of kindergarten art was a discovery of profound importance to East German designers mired in their own modernist past. Remember, socialist realist doctrine equated modernism with capitalist acts of barbarity, including, uh, quote, the uprooting of national culture, the destruction of national consciousness, and direct support for the militaristic policies of American imperialism, end quote. Former modernists thus became potential traitors every time they picked up their pencil. Hopp's article depicted modernist barbarity in a far gentler light, more like that of the unsocialized child whose scrawls were an unwitting betrayal of the party mandate for healthy realism. And like the toddler's eventual grasp of realism, which required no, quote, special talent, no, quote, creative intuition, the skill of planning rather than designing one's way towards socialist realism was available to any architect willing to work at it. Within the context of the party's cultural revolution, Hopp's account of design development was profoundly optimistic, proposing that post-war beauty, defined as neoclassicism, could be spun from modernist dross. Uh, but another set of design schemes by Hopp for the Max Hütte House of Culture that were suppressed for pub from publication for almost two generations could easily have demolished his statement of faith in would-be socialist realists. Sketches held back from the article revealed Hopp's pre-extant fluency in the handling of neoclassical form and proportion and detail a skill gained through the rigors of his Beaux-Arts influence design education circa 1910. Architects nearing retirement age, like Hopp, turned out to be much better prepared for their new role as, as Stalinist cultural revolutionaries than younger colleagues trained in modernist design methods. What the Bau Academy really needed was a fresh cohort of Beaux-Arts trained designers, a fact soon reflected in East German architectural pedagogy. But until the new generation of neoclassicists came online, 
Hopp's article fueled hopes among former modernists that like children struggling to draw model workers, they too could attain the goals of a socialist realist mission civilisatrice through guidance and hard work. In coming to terms publicly with his modernist past and providing a way to follow in his footsteps, Hopp was inspirational, if not exactly in the way implied by his article. He had come to embody the merging of individual and establishment goals that characterized a socialist realist bureaucracy and its hierarchical ranks of cultural revolutionaries. Out of the sediment of a design career well on the way to retirement had climbed a new man of post-war socialism. Thank you very much. happy to be able to develop some of the intentions of the previous presentations. The presentation here, namely the relationship uh, between the subject and the object. And um, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference. First of all, and um, Anna for her careful reading of the paper and everybody here for coming. Um, the major public park in the Soviet Union, which the officials proudly named the Central Park of Culture and Rest, was opened in Moscow in 1928 as a highly ordered and programmatic site. And here on this photograph by Hannes Meyer, you can see how it looked like sometime in the middle, or in, in the early 1930s when he was in Moscow. Designed as a trial ground for socialist space, it also served as a place for ideological propaganda its first architects were Konstantin Melnikov and El Lisitsky, both renowned members of the, of the avant-garde. However, after the war, in the 1940s and 50s, the Park of Culture and Rest, or Gorky Park, as it became known after 1932, had significantly changed its program and was turned into a mixture of a strolling park and an entertainment park like Coney Island. At first sight, the conflict of the initial idea and the final result, which persisted in this form throughout the rest of the Soviet era, seems to fit into the narrative of dismantling of Soviet avant-garde by the state after 1932, which is well known to Western scholarship. However, in this presentation, I will add another dimension to the opposition between the state and architecture in late Stalinist Soviet Union, introducing the thought player, the people, I will demonstrate that the Soviet state was not as omnipotent and powerful as it often seems to be. Rather than juxtaposing the state with practicing architects, um, I will, accepting that it was to a certain degree reified by them, point to the collective agency of the people as, it, as its more successful opponent. And uh, um, I will start with the revolutionary ideals uh, which were developed by architects in the late 1920s, 30s. And then I will go on um, to the prosaic reality with, with which these ideals were confronted. And then I will conclude uh, with the resulting layout of the park. Um, the initial agenda of the park was outlined in the competition brief and developed in some of the entries to the competition of 1931 which took place three years after the park was already open to the public. Uh, such entries as those submitted by architects Moisier Ginsburg, um, the one, the drawing on the right, and Konstantin Melnikov, uh, the one on the left, are characterized by the high level of mass involvement into various activities that were going on in the park. We can speculate that the park, as it existed in the first half of the 1930s, became a miniature socialist utopia. At least in the architect's projects, it served as a model for an ideal socialist urban settlement in which not only was recreation collectivized, but the organization of space also mimicked the principles of leftist social urban planning. For example, in such aspects as the separation of activities and the reconciliation of nature and the city by turning nature into a matrix for urban pastimes. 
divided into such zones as the mass participation zone, the sports zone, the scientific zone, and so on, the park supposedly optimized the use of a visitor's time in satisfying his or her recreational needs. Most of the activities allowed for the visitors of the park were of a special kind. Collective and highly programmatic, they left no possibility for individual or family recreation and no freedom of choice. Mass processions, demonstrations, meetings, concerts, and sports games were regularly imposed ways of spending one's time in the park. These activities were intended to form a new subject of the new society, the masses, as opposed to the old individual and group subjects. To accommodate these activities, the usual park lawns and shaded pathways had to give way to broad avenues and spacious open grounds. I believe that this emphasis on collectivity, together with the ideological propaganda from which it was inseparable, became the most characteristic feature of the park of culture and rest during the first years of its existence. Another interpretation of the parks as the site of subject formation, this time intended to produce individual subjects, was suggested in 1935 when a group of psychologists led by one of the fathers of Soviet psychology, Alexei Nikolaevich Leontiev, conducted a series of thorough psychological observations and experiments in the Central Park of Culture and Rest. The goal of their research, which was most likely commissioned by the director of the park, Betsy Glan, was first to determine how people actually spend their time in the park and to what extent the park fulfilled their intentions and desires and second, to suggest the ways of modifying this behavior and these intentions through reconfiguring the design of the whole park and its particular sectors. Leontiev suggested a peculiar psychological model of the so-called, quote-unquote, vertical principle of exposition, which unfolds from the most striking and attractive towards deeper and more intellectually challenging exhibits. Quoting the director Betty Glantz's words, he suggested a move, quote, from accordion and guitar to sophisticated symphony music, from amateur agitation brigade to grandiose performances at the mass theater, from a popular movie lecture to a serious scholarly talk, unquote. The <laughs> ultimate goal of this movement for Glan and Leontiev was to develop a, quote, polytechnic person that is a new Soviet subject who has a broad range of interests and wider erudition in the fields important for the industrializing country, physics, technology, engineering, aviation, new methods of agriculture, and so on. And um, this much for the uh, utopian projects, and now I turn to the prosaic reality with which they were confronted. And here you can see a dancing ground uh, from the 1970s and um, a cafe in the Minsk Park, uh, which also was titled Gorky Park, as all of them seem to be in 1949. Um, the evidence from the period demonstrates that this sophisticated ideological program remained ignored by the visitors to Soviet parks. As opposed to a complicated plan of a typical early park of culture and rest with its stages, museums, and culture palaces, a subjective map of the usual user was in fact reduced to an alley connecting the entrance to the dancing area with kiosks selling drinks and benches alongside this alley. Here is, for example, a quotation from a memoir of a regular Soviet park user, which describes the events of the mid-1930s when he was a teenager, and in which elements from the propagandistic program are perceived within the vision of a park of culture and rest as an entirely recreational space. The action takes place in Kharkov, one of the largest cities in southern Russia, now part of Ukraine. And this park, also Gorky Park, um, is one of over 2,000 parks of culture and rest created in the USSR by the mid-1950s. And I quote, nor Arkasha, neither Iska, and these are two boys' names, um, nor of them had bicycles, so Ivan and I were biking mostly during the daytime, and in the evenings the whole company would go strolling into the park 
Now our company of musketeers was joined by two girls from our class. At that time, Gorky Park was very popular with Kharkov's residents, and on weekends and in the evenings, it attracted crowds of the strolling public. It had everything that one could wish for rest. Two dancing grounds, green theater, summer movie theater, Lapin Pavilion, labyrinth of distorting mirrors, concert stages, and even a parachute tower. There was an entrance charge only in the evenings when the artists were performing on the concert stages. The entrance was only 25 kopecks, but we were still saving money and having bought tickets for the girls infiltrated through the holes in the fences or entered from the park's backside, which lacked a fence. At the end of the central park alley, there was a dancing ground where the brass band played. Here everybody could dance. They weren't charging additional fees for it. The second dancing ground was located in the heart of the park. Jazz was played there and the entrance was not free. It had a nice stage, projectors and catalans of colored light bulbs. But we would rarely go there. This was the place for elite youth, which could not only pay for everything, but also dress well. Sometimes, when I happened to be nearby, I enviously watched the gaudy crowd swirling with jazz sounds and thought, what are these people? Where do they come from? After all, the famine just ended. End quote. The memorist keeps in memory such spaces as the Green Theater, summer movie theater, concert stages, and a parachute tower, which could have appeared in the park as a means for propaganda and mass work, but later were re-envisioned as purely recreational spaces alongside with such facilities as dancing grounds and the Laughing Pavilion. For him, the park was primarily a space for dancing in the company of his friends, and the memoirs suggest no indication of any self-identification with the mass subject or the consumption of any ideological propaganda by the author. Instead, traditional forms of socializing and recreation have reclaimed the space in the city's public park. By the mid-1930s, it became clear to Stalin's administration that the visitors were silently sabotaging the propagandistic mission of the Park of Culture and Rest. Moreover, contrary to the cliché image of a totalitarian state system, the bureaucrats not only accepted this fact, but also started searching for a new design solution that would take into account the habits and desires of the public. Already in 1933, the parks were told to, quote, turn towards a cheerful, gay, and amusing recreation, unquote. In 1936, well-known satirical writers Ilf and Petrov wrote a satire in the central newspaper Pravda, in which they, mocking the previously dominant mass participation program, depicted the plight of a man who came to the park of culture and rest, but was not permitted to go his own way. In the story, Every time the young man would come into the park with a girlfriend and was looking for a secluded spot in which to sit on the grass with her, a group of activists would grab them by the hands and force them to dance. Likewise, the psychologists' attempts to transform the park into an institution that changes personality and the result, the visitors' behavior, were rejected by the party. In 1937, the director, Betty Glan, was subjected to political repression. And up to that date, no new experimental solutions were suggested or tried in Gorky Park. It is re revealing that post-war publications, which cite Leontiev's research, quote only those aspects of it that concern the actual figures of the distribution of the visitors within the park's sectors. The idea of modifying people's intentions and desires of making the park a birthplace of a new subject was left aside. Instead, the party wanted to use this space for satisfying the existing needs and desires of the people, which were previously considered undeveloped and low by the avant-garde architects and psychologists. If for Leontiev, the fact that only a minority of the visitors were interested in the village of science and technology was a pitiful situation that had to be corrected, 
For the post-World War II sociologists and park managers, this was the expression of the will of the people that had to be respected. And as such, sociological research in the park was resumed after the war. And now I turn to the, um, the park's layout as it was developed by the state in response to people's desires. Um, according to the post-war books and manuals, the two major desires that had to be satisfied by the parks of culture and rest were to, quote, stroll and to visit attractions. Both of them were purely recreational and had nothing to do with the park's previous educational and propagandistic program. The satisfaction of these two desires became the core goal of all parks of culture and rest in the second half of the 1940s and persisted as such until the collapse of the Soviet Union, even in spite of the disfavor of Stalin's principles in architecture and city planning that followed in the late 1950s. I believe that it was precisely the formal indeterminacy of parks of culture and rest and the innate functionalism of their concept. That is the fact that they were defined in terms of functional program rather than style that allowed this Stalinist concept to become a part of Khrushchev's and later Brezhnev's modernism. The first of these two components of the simple functional program of the post-war parks of culture and rest was strolling. This component generated a large number of paths and routes that meandered through the park. It was also economically easy to achieve since in most cases, parks of culture and rest were created in woodlands or in the sites of pre-existing aristocratic estates. Always wide enough to allow a group of people to pass and supplemented with benches, these paths became convenient spaces for slow leisurely group movement and conversations as well as for quiet rest. And here you can see one of those paths um, in a publication from 1935 that is from Moscow Sokolniki Park, pictured empty of people, and this very similar path in Moscow Gorky Park, um, actually photographed by Henri Cartier Bresson in 1954. Um, the next component, um, attractions, were targeted for children as well as for adults, and included observation wheels, wheels um, swings, and so on. If in the first post-war years, the attractions were mostly improvised and easy to build, such as those that you can see top left from a 1930s publication. <coughs> then gradually, and especially in the 60s and 70s, they became replaced by industrially produced standardized attractions. Dancing grounds and performance areas, too, were a necessary part of every park of culture and rest throughout the USSR period. These ways of spending one's time in a park reflected traditional peasant ways of recreation, which became dominant in the Soviet cities in the aftermath of Stalin's urbanization. Peasants' habits, their ways of spending their leisure time in their prosaic attitude to nature were brought by them to the parks of culture and rest where they soon became acknowledged by the state and this acknowledgement allowed for the consolidation of the type of public park that persisted in the USSR from the 1940s until its collapse in the late 80s when, it, when uh, it was exported to the other countries of the Soviet bloc. Moreover, it seems that since Stalin's death, the cultural and educational component of the park being least popular was steadily declining and almost totally disappeared towards the end of the Soviet rule, in spite of the continuing use of the Park of Culture and Rest title. Being neither a space for unification with nature, which would be a normal program for a 19th century uh, metropolitan pastoral park, nor a site for mass activities and propaganda, which was the initial architect's agenda of the park, nor a place for education and intellectual development which was the psychologist's approach. But following the people's desires, the park became a place for group recreation, strolling, visiting attractions, gathering, and dancing. 
The use of sociological data and the consideration of the mass visitors' intentions and desires in order to determine the ways of the modification of the park's program and design makes Park of Culture and Rest a truly people's park, at least to the extent this term can be applied to Stalin's totalitarian society. The acknowledgement of this fact endows with agency the subjects of the totalitarian state, which are usually considered to be totally silenced. Moreover, we can see that this agency was offered to them by none other than the state itself. Conforming to the so-called revisionist school of Soviet historiography, which is interested in the support of Stalin's system from below, the case of the usage of sociological data for the perk of culture and rest in Moscow suggests that the state, for its part, was actively seeking for this support. Thank you. Great. Well, first of all, I want to thank um, all the organizers for this flawless <coughs> and enormous event. I can't imagine how much work went into it. And also, um, the, the Anna and the other members of the panel who I think have set up a lot of ideas that we can talk about. Um, so with that, I think I'll just begin. Um, if I can figure out how this works. In late 1968, the writer Yuri Poluhin visited a nearly complete experimental housing complex known as Quarter Number no. 10 in Moscow's rapidly developing Novyachiryomishki district. The Dom Novobobrita, the house of the new way of life, was the highlight of his trip. Designed by Natan Ostaman and a team of architects, engineers, and social scientists, the building's name conveyed its social trans socially transformative function. More than inert matter, the Dom Novobobrita was a fundamentally political project, a blueprint for a new collective way of life. For Peluchin, the project's ambition represented more than a utopian vision. It was, in his words, not a fantasy, but a reality. Since the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953 Nikita, and Nikita Khrushchev's ascent to the summit of Soviet power, Novya Chiromsky had become, according to Peluchin, a place where, quote, many designs for the future had been reborn. End quote. This district condensed the aspirations of Soviet architecture's post-Stalinist paradigm. Novya Chiryomsky's widely publicized quarter number nine presented austere concrete panel buildings set in a verdant landscape as a model for, the Soviet, resi for Soviet residential architecture, a model that was anti-monumental anti and cleansed of what Khrushchev called formal excess. Also designed by a team led by Osterman, this looked like the fulfillment of Khrushchev's promise of housing for all Soviet citizens. Polukin saw quarter number 10 and the house of the new way of life as a direct descendant of this post-Stalinist approach to architecture and residential design. He celebrated the building's complex program in his report for the Literaturnaya Gazeta, the literary newspaper which sent him um, you know, on a site visit. Quote, two 16-story residential slabs gaze upon the social center, he wrote. Quote, the first stories are not residential, but given over to a club, service quarters, uh, playrooms for children, the slabs are linked by a heated glazed vestibule in, two, in a two-story social center that has everything, beginning with a large cafe, a swimming pool, a winter garden, and ending with a finished sauna, a dry cleaner, and a barber. Polukin tried to maintain a degree of skepticism about the building, but had little success. Oh, sorry. Each apartment was fully furnished, and residents were to have access to appliances such as sewing machines and vacuums through a central loan office. It seemed like the architects had anticipated the future tenants' every need, except, Polukin noted, the need for a kitchen. Each small apartment resembled a well, an extended stay hotel room, having a full bathroom but only a cooking nook with two electric stove plates and a sink. In place of private kitchens, each floor of the residential slabs housed both a cafe and a large shared kitchen. Communal dining compensated for the re reduction of private utilities, and each of the building's 16 floors contained a shared study expanding the amount of space available to each tenant. Quote, a collective will live in this building complex, and this determines everything, Polukin observed, noting that a different psychological atmosphere will be created here, 
But Lukin touched upon the ultimate political ambition of the team of architects, engineers, sociologists, and economists who had designed the building and established its program, namely, to create a socially transformative atmosphere which would turn atomized, uh, an atomized group of tenants into a collective. Another, com another commentator on the building, the venerable economist Stanislav um, Strumelin, redoubled Palukin's observations, writing that the building, quote, creates optimal conditions for the successful formation of the norms and regulations of a communist way of life. In this, the House of the New Way of Life registers a complex and deliberate response to the revised program of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union that Khrushchev had presented at the 22nd Party Congress in 1961. At this event, the Soviet Premier declared that, quote, we shall, in the main, have built a communist society within 20 years. Khrushchev predicted that the USSR's transition to communism would be achieved by, quote, improving and developing social relations with due, amount, with, with due account of the disappearance of old forms of life and the appearance of new forms, end quote. The House of the New Way of Life gave architectural form to the Communist Party's predictions. It was an attempt to materialize the social and ideological mission of the Soviet state, to create a space that might both embody new forms of social organization and become a mechanism for the creation of a new way of life. This response to Khrushchev's assertion of communism's nascent state entailed the recovery of several important aspects of Soviet architecture's disciplinary profile. Most importantly, the rediscovery of the revolutionary social mission advanced by Soviet architects during the 1920s, and more broadly, a belief in the social agency of architecture. Since the beginning of the 1960s, architects and historians in both the Soviet Union and the West had begun to look at what had, come, had been called the, quote, heroic age of modern architecture with new eyes. The House of the New Way of Life articulates this revival of modernism's legacy as an architectural projection of the imminent arrival of communism in the Soviet Union. And although the ambitions of the building were transformative, the building's designers viewed the project not in opposition to the aims of the Soviet state, but as a possible future for communist society's spatial articulation. That is, as a microcosm of, a communist, self, uh, of communist self organization and governance. As such, the House of the New Way of Life reframes the relationship that's at the center of this conference. It asks us to consider not only architecture and the state, but also architecture as the state. Nearly 10 years separate the conception and completion of the House of the New Way of Life. Between 1962, when the first project appeared, and 1971, when the first tenants moved in, the cultural politics of Soviet architecture underwent a rapid set of transformations. The first few years of the building's design and construction correspond to the period now widely associated with Ilya Ehrenburg's famous description of the years of destalinization as the thaw. The decade between 1954, when Khrush uh, with Khrushchev's rise to power within the Communist Party, witnessed a relative liberalization of cultural restrictions in a variety of cre creative fields. By the time the House of the New Way of Life was completed, Leonid Brezhnev had succeeded uh, Khrushchev as leader of the Communist Party, transforming the optimism of the thaw into a social and cultural stasis that came to be known as stagnation. The House of the New Way of Life stands between these two moments, regis registering both the renewed sense of social agency that architects experienced during the thaw and the frustration of collective agency in the twilight of late socialism. Architecture and construction were among the first disciplines to experience the effects of desalinization. In a now famous speech delivered at a conference of architects and builders in 1954, Khrushchev denounced the so-called formal excess characteristic of post-war architecture and called for the introduction of industrial methods in all spheres of construction. He challenged the notion that had emerged during the era of high Stalinism that formal excess could be justified as an antidote to constructivism. Although he stopped short of a call for a revival of constructor, constructivist principles, Khrushchev nevertheless advocated a shift toward frankly industrial design and made mass production an architectural ideal. Although Soviet architects had already experimented with systems of prefabrication for nearly 20, 20 years, Khrushchev's speech provided new impetus for the building industry to make industri the industrialization of construction a priority, particularly in the field of residential design. Novia Cheryomushki's quarter number nine, designed and constructed between 1956 and 1957, encapsulated the transformation of architectural priorities in the first years of the thaw. 
Osterman and his team of architects coordinated apartment houses, shops, schools, cinema, and other facilities on this 12 hectare site, presenting Muscovites with a vision of dramatically improved living conditions. While shared apartments represented the standard for non-elite housing in Moscow, Novichy Romishki's quarter number nine sought to provide families with private two and three bedroom apartments. The development suggested that, that dignified living conditions for average Soviet citizens might be achieved through the rapid development of the building industry. The success of quarter number nine facilitated the construction of a second experimental housing district in Novichy Romishki, quarter number 10. The district's unimaginative name belies the radical reformation of Soviet architecture's social agency that is embedded within the project. Designed by Osterman, the House of the New Way of Life was the most innovative element of this new quarter. This building differed from his previous residential design in a critical way. Whereas the buildings of quarter number nine sought to provide private accommodations to each household, the House of the New Way of Life questioned the validity of the family unit as, a basic, as the basis for residential design. Osterman and his colleagues understood the House of the New Way of Life as a reprise of the Doma Komuni, or communal houses, that Soviet architects had developed during the 1920s and 1930s. The Narkomfin building designed by Morse Ginsburg and even uh, Ivan Nikolaev's dormitory for students of uh, Moscow's Textile Institute, um, each of which sacrificed private space for the expansion of collective facilities, served as the primary points of reference for the program of the House of the New Way of Life. Quote, the general idea of the organization of a collective way of life and the liberation of women from housework brings the building closer to earlier projects, Osterman concluded. The commitment of the building's designers to, trans to transform the lives of the building's tenants recalls Ginsburg's statement of 1927 that constructivism presents the architect with, quote, the task of life building, of the organization of new forms of life, end quote. Architecture in both Osterman's and Ginsburg's estimation possess the power to transform everyday reality, to induce the formation of new social relations. By 1965, when Osterman and, and his colleagues had articulated the program of the House of the New Way of Life, the legacy of constructivism had reemerged as a topic for historical discussion, both within the Soviet Union and in the West. Whereas constructivism had been called a reactionary bourgeois ideology in the final years of Stalin's reign, it had become a popular subject of research and a facet of contemporary debate in the USSR. The writer Viktor Nekrasov was among the first to suggest that constructivism was not only of historical interest, but that the lessons of constructivist architecture might have some bearing on the contemporary, on the contemporary moment. In the early 1960s, the prolific historian uh, Selim Han Magomedov, author of the landmark Pioneers of Soviet Architecture, began publishing his first articles on Moise Ginsburg and Ivan Leonidov. The legacy of constructivism was published in the West primarily through architectural journals. In the landmark issue of uh, 1962 of Casa Bella Continuita, um, shown here, um, the history of Soviet architecture was brought to a Western audience in a powerful graphic survey. Um, shortly thereafter, George Kandilis would describe what he called the heroic moment of modern architecture in the USSR in an encyclopedic uh, issue of L'Architecture de Jaudoui of 1964. And finally, well, not finally, but uh, in succession, Allison and Peter, uh, Peter Smithson would fold the history of Soviet modernism into their survey of the heroic period of modern architecture for the British journal Architectural Design in 1965. Osterman's project for the House of the New Way of Life emerged from this general re revival of interest in, in the architecture of constructivism. But the building had more than a superficial relationship to the radical projects of the 1920s. Among the many social scientists that Osterman and his team consulted with during the building's design was the economist Stanislav Strumilin, whose contributions to Soviet economics date back to the 1920s. At that time, Strumilin emerged as a strong supporter of the collectivi collectivization of everyday life. During the years of the first five-year plan, that is from 1928 to 1932, he argued that the socialist city should be built upon a network of social services that would achieve an economy of scale by substituting collective services for individual labor. Removing activities such as cooking and cleaning from the private sphere would both help women enter the workforce and stimulate a new network of social bonds among Soviet citizens. In the early 1960s, Strunlin re uh, returned to the topic of, collecti of the collectivization of everyday life, articulating his ideas in the context of Khrushchev's optimistic prediction that the Soviet Union would achieve communism by 1980. 
in Communism and the Lives of Workers, a widely circulated essay of 1960, he offered um, an architectural prediction of the USSR's transition to a higher stage of social development. He described, quote, Dvartsi Komuni, communal palaces, for up to 2,500 residents. These buildings, like the communal houses devised by Soviet architects during the 1920s, were to include cafeterias, laundromats, shared study rooms, and sports halls for the inhabitants. Although the spatial model that Strumeling described here was not new, that it could attract serious consideration was unprecedented. The collective reorganization of everyday life had, had in fact been a taboo topic in Soviet Union since 1930, when the Communist Party issued a, a decree that put an end to the, quote, semi-fantastical architectural projects that sought to construct communist social relations, quote, in one leap. This decree frustrated architects' plans to make communal houses the fundamental unit of in the reconstruction of socialist cities and place the organization of everyday life beyond the scope of architecture's disciplinary concerns. Guided by Strumeling's recommendations, the authors of the, new, of the House of the New Way of Life sought to recover both the form of the communal house and the social mission which it contained. Whereas the primary forces of Novia Chiromichi's quarter number nine had been the family unit, the House of the New Way of Life highlighted the importance of the collective. The reduced sizes and facilities within individual apartments encouraged residents to participate in communal dining and recreation. The notion of living space was dispersed uh, throughout the many shared areas of the complex. But the dispersal of living space alone was not sufficient to encourage co a collective atmosphere within the house of the new way of life. The building's designers went a step further than their constructivist uh, predecessors in articulating in addition to a spatial program, a blueprint for, social, for the social organization of the tenants. Osterman called this the, quote, union of the house of the new way of life. The union was to be a legal entity, which would obtain a degree of autonomy by effectively renting the building and its territory from the state. The organization's primary task was, quote, to combine collective and individual forms of organization with the aim of forming a communist worldview among its members, end quote. Osterman and his colleagues outlined a complex organizational structure for the union, describing the process of collective decision-making, administration, conflict resolution. With numerous feedback loops between individual tenants and, and larger committees, the union was designed to function not as a rigid hierarchy, but as a democratic organism. As a body composed of all tenants of the House of the New Way of Life, the union represented a commitment to collective living. Its structure fused individuals into a larger social body. That is, the House of the New Way of Life was, was both a residential structure and a structure of governance. For the building's designer, these two aspects of the project were inseparable. The model of co communist self-organization that the designers of the House of the New Way, Way of Life cr created was not simply a tool to administer and, subs and sustain a, a residential collective composed of more than 2,000 people. It was an attempt to create a microcosm of the Soviet Union's imminent communist future. The House of the New Way of Life approximated Strumeling's description of, the communal pa of communal palaces as future units in a, quote, system of self-governing organizations, end quote. The building was an, was an attempt to condense and realize a model of the highly organized society of free, socially conscious working people that the Communist Party predicted the Soviet Union would become. Although early visitors to the, to the building were deeply impressed by the social mission of the House of the New Way of Life, the building had little chance to perform, its function, perform the functions with which it was invested. By the time construction was completed in 1971, the optimism characteristic of Khrushchev's thaw had given way to the perpetual twilight of Brezhnev's stagnation. The program of the House of the New Way of Life shifted along with Moscow's cultural climate, ultimately becoming a dormitory for the Moscow State University. It's tempting to see this conf the conflation of residential program and communist self-governance um, that lies th at the heart of the House of the New Way of Life as a utopian proposition. But it should be borne in mind that the observers such as Yuri Paluchin, the writer with whom I began, saw the project, quote, not as a fantasy, but as a reality. That is, as a fragment of a potentially obtainable communist future in which architectural design and organized self-governance might become indistinguishable. Thank you.
uh, or rather what I really want to say is, uh, and the reason I was uh, saying that I really am happy that this panel is existing within this conference is that it actually is helping me uh, think through the things that I am already thinking through. Now, I don't want to repeat your papers uh, or recap them in any way, but for me, a few big issues that are, that, you know, have been sort of, that I've been trying to deal with personally and that I think your papers uh, bring up uh, might go through a series of things that are like the position of the architect in this context, the, the sort of uh, status of statements made in this context, and maybe the relationship to the avant-garde and the later years, which you all in a way picked up. But so the first uh, question that um, I wanted to ask you all is that, and I think you, it already gets a little bit addressed through that sort of uh, explanation of uh, avant-garde and what comes later or the position of it or the historicizing of it and so forth. But for me, uh, what struck me is that uh, even though we have a kind of situation where the position of the architect in this context, the state architect, if you will, is different than the, the norm uh, in terms of writing history, basically. There are figures that emerge in each of your papers as specific figures. Uh, in uh, uh, Greg's, basically, the figure of Hopp, in, in Riggs, the figure of Osterman, and in Allah's, not so much actually the figure of the architect, but uh, the, the picture that we saw would be the figure of a sociologist or the psychologist in this case. Uh, but so for me, I'm, I'm wondering how we can, whether in some way the kind of the change in the position of the architect and the particular relationship of the architects to the state, whether they are the state or not even is a question, but like, how does that in a way, and does it impact for you the very structure of the narratives that you create? So, how do we, so, so I'm going to go, all of my questions will go basically to the kind of, what is our theory of the second world history? So that, how do you, what's basically, what's your position on this? If I don't care how you, <laughs> what order you get on. Well, I'll, I'll just start in terms of uh, the emergence of Hans Hopp. Um, it, it, in many ways, is not at all surprising that a specific, a specific figure emerges. You have a um, society in a fairly dramatic process of social, of social reconstruction. Uh, there, because we understand as East Germans, uh, as East German party members who are governing, that there needs to be, that the Soviet solution of society is a solution. It's a global communist system. That's their own words. I'm not inventing that term. So essentially, the USSR is the paradigm. The Stalinist system in the USSR has already developed a system in which there will be different uh, portions of society, different structure of society. And one part of society is a model worker, the worker. One is an intelligentsia there will be an, a creative intelligentsia. So if there is going to be a creative intelligentsia, which incidentally may be paid 10 times more than a worker, so it's a very well remunerated uh, group, someone has, to, someone has to be emerge, someone has to emerge as a model. So there's gonna be somebody who plays that role. It could be Hans, Hans Hopp, it could be some other person, but someone will emerge as an intelligent uh, in the system. So in, in this particular case, the fact that he is uh, at the academy plays a role in some way? I mean, so oh, he, because he, it seems He could like not be that figure if he were not right. the so leader of a Bau Academy uh, master studio. That's okay. by definition who is Which going to for work. me implicates then the issue or the, the entire sort of layer of um, the pedagogical institutions involved. In, in between that sort of relationship between architects and, uh, and state firms and the uh, state directives. Well, the right. But at, at this particular moment, the Bau Academy is formed in 1951. There's no educational system that is in place to produce these figures. So mm -hmm. they have to emerge as uh, incarnations, really, of a social order. So somebody's going to do it. And this, and in a sense, it, it for these architects, it's not really the creation of a, a kind of mass subject. This is a subjectivity, and somebody assembles a, a subjectivity from elements that are there for them to 
do this. And one has to keep in mind that East Berlin is a very interesting case study because an architect could simply walk across to the West. I mean, just you could just walk out of the system. And somebody like Hans Hoff or Hermann Henselman did not do that. They stayed and became model architects. I think in my case, um, apart from Leontief, who was, as I mentioned, a psychologist, um, and who was employed by the state to conduct his research, there are also a number of other people, um, such as the architects whom I started with, um, Ginsburg and Melnikov. Uh, Melnikov was officially um, the director of the park, um, not the director, but the head architect for a while, as, as was Lisitsky. And um, there was very important person, Betty Glan, the director. And all of them were in a very complicated relationship with the state. Um, on the part of the architects, um, I don't think there was any opposition of them um, to the state. They were trying uh, to get the intentions. They were trying to grasp what the state actually wants from them. And um, that was evident in all the entries for the 1931 competition. And then Glan, the director, was a state employee. And at the same time, she was patronizing um, this innovative um, psychological research. She was patronizing um, the work of avant-garde architects. And at the same time, she was hoping, from, from what I understand, she was hoping that this is precisely what the state wants. She would by no means um, be um, try to perceive herself as an oppositional figure. And the same for Leontiev, um, who just, who was trying to conduct um, uh, the research started by the state sponsored laboratory. Um, if I can respond. Um, I think the implications of your question are much larger and of a kind of mythological nature, and they're, they're things that I've been trying to struggle with as well. Because it, I mean, the question I think you're essentially asking is, what do we, what do we think about authorship, and why use biography as the as yes. the narrative um, for what what we're doing here when we know we're dealing with societies that are um, fairly, you know, have have a very very intense set of um, rigidly organized social structures. And one, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, it's, um, it looks like perhaps uh, the easy way out, you know, to find, you know, to find the figure and follow him or her or, um, you know, one idea and trace it through these, um, you know, the span of a career or something. But I, I guess one of the reasons to, that I've started to look at individuals within this um, kind of second world context is because, um, as, well, actually as a way to understand institutions. Because institutions, particularly with Osterman and you know, any number of, of figures, at least in the Soviet, Soviet context, I find are constantly being uh, renovated and reformulated. And the, 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 kind of, the bureaucracy is not stable. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is in, and so by looking at one person as, as a kind of narrative thread, you can actually um, Reveal the the changes or the inst the instabilities within these uh, these institutions. For example, Osterman, who uh, who I kind of uh, I highlighted today, designed you know quarters nine and ten under the auspices of different institutions, but he was doing more or less the same kind of work and working with the same kind of people. So there's there's there are, there are continuities as well, you know, within this kind of chaotic um, and what what I th what I see as being a fundamentally unstable kind of bureaucratic planning apparatus. I mean, I, that's, I mean, I was exactly going towards that, to see why do we rely on the biographical narrative or the usual sort of even avant-garde narrative uh, in order to tell the stories of a context in which an avant-garde as an as a institution, as a position, is no, no longer available, at least rhetorically. And so in Greg's case, it sounds like actually there is a version of an avant-garde, or at least, an imp well, certainly uh, this a, a kind of intelligentsia. It is, it is uh, an avant-garde of, a, of yeah. a socialist realist right. cultural revolution. Yeah. But I also do think, you know, the, I mean, certainly having, you know, writing on this topic, the kind of tri crisis of who do you follow? Do you follow an object, a discussion, or a subject is a serious one, and, uh, and a methodological, serious methodological question, one where I do agree that basically uh, 
part of the strange dance between the directives, the officials, and the architects is going to be played out through particular subjects mm -hmm. rather than somehow en masse, even if they, in the end, sort of produce a pattern of behavior. Or, mm -hmm. uh, but so related to that, yeah. You want to I just wanted to add something that actually what my, the whole point of my presentation was is was an attempt to get away from this Mm -hmm. uh, idea of an architect as the subject, uh, uh, yeah, as as the subject of what is of the design, and um, to 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 try and to grasp uh, this invisible uh, mass um, of agents, mass yeah. yeah, collective agent of the mm -hmm. people as more mm -hmm. active subject. I mean, so along the same lines, basically, uh, and again, like self-servingly uh, uh, you know when I write about this stuff I often find myself wanting to put quotes around uh, my own statements about the work uh, and and uh, so for me I want to sort of talk about maybe the status of statements that you find in an archive and how do you deal with them because uh, because in a way a directive is different than a specific client request and so from the outset, uh, the kind of response that the architects are involved in producing uh, is one of a kind of a stranger, a different interpretation than we're, again, used to in architectural history. So how do you evaluate your evidence? evidence no? It's an evidentiary dilemma. Um, if I can respond again, uh, I mean, that's for me, that the, this kind of problem between directive and response and execution is part of this instability that uh, that I'm trying to highlight. Is that yes, th I mean, as as documents, these uh, a directive has a different status, and trying to trying to work out what that status um, is is a complicated process. But this is one of the reasons. This is one of the reasons why um, I think it's in it's interesting, at least, to test you know, as, as a kind of experiment, you know, um, what did a number of different subjects, a number of different individuals do in response to a directive? Mm -hmm. You know, how, and so for that reason, like being very precise and, and uh, looking at this problem of biography and really individual agency, the agency of the architect or the, the team of architects in responding to, say, the directive that, you know, the, uh, that modernism is not satisfactory, <laughs> for example, or mm -hmm. that excess is no longer valid. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 there's a range of positions, and and I think uh, they're, 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 still, they're still yet to be explored. But I, I, I think I would probably support the idea that there are different mm -hmm. th these directives and these uh, statements do occupy particular spaces. I mean, furthermore, you know, like the well, we talked about intention a little bit in the last panel, but the idea that when you get an architect describing their intention in a journal and so forth, it's always uh, like how you treat that is mm -hmm. a really uh, specific question. It, it goes beyond even sort of looking at the particular product that comes out of their interpretation mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of the dance, but sort of what is the statement, what is the mm -hmm. value of that statement even, I think is a, mm -hmm. is a question. Well, for me, it was important to think about um, how these directi directives are changeable, how they are unstable, how they contradict each other, and try to understand who's behind them and um, why are they <coughs> so and so at every particular moment of history. And it was rather was a statement whose directives are they, um, mm -hmm. maybe rather than how do they work and what is the mechanism of control. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in my study, this is like one <laughs> case study of a number of architects. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Ricky that essentially you look at a number of people and what the, how they respond to these directives. And <coughs> just as a sort of to encapsulate it, Mark Stamm was uh, teaching at the uh, design school at Berlin Weissensee. He came, they came down on him of this new kind of cultural revolution. He tried to find a compromise with modernism. He was put under house arrest. Within a year, he was in exile. So mm -hmm. essentially, that's the other mm -hmm. possible response. Uh, but also, in terms of reading this article and trying to read what into what does Hop mean when he says this thing that you know a modern design can progress, can have a process of design development that ends up making it a neoclassical design. That's I, I actually 
firmly believe that you have to take ideology seriously, you have to look at it. And so for me, the parallel between child development, mm -hmm. developmental psychology ideology really was the only thing that I could, that could start to make that proposition, design proposition, make sense to me. I mean, I fully, I mean, I've encountered many of the tropes. Uh, I'm sure that's the, that's the thing that happens in a town like this that uh, you've all basically described. But this one, particular one of uh, how sort of developmental notion of uh, socialist realism comes as a natural conclusion here uh, of sorts, which I think actually allows then the next step also that actually let us rework it a little bit and now it's going to look uh, different after Khrushchev. So Khrushchev, even though he sounds like a break, actually is just a step uh, on top of that. Um, can, can I ask you a, qu a question in, in response to this? Um, because I, I think what what's always floating behind these statements, and I think some of your line of questioning is really the, the question of commitment and the status of these directives. And you know, we're talking about control. And the question is, you know, why would you do this? You know, why would architects actually make these statements? Why would they? Why would they um, not try to opt out in some ways? And not that's not necessarily an option, but I, but I feel like that's kind of what well, you're Well, I mean, for me, it. the questions are actually on our level at this table. Uh -huh. It's like, how do we deal with this fact? But I think, you know, in the, in the second, what, what all of these contexts share is that there is no way out. This is mm -hmm. a situation. So then how do you, you know, clearly they're having to find ways to work within it. But the sort of the developmental story for me is, it is important. I think it is actually something that talks about the kind of socialism's uh, timeline or re relationship to time, uh, yeah. as opposed to things before it. But I, I would just uh, uh, clarify one thing from my perspective. There's a profound break uh, at the moment of Khrushchev, uh, in the sense that the party is that. infallible. Yes. It's like the Pope says women cannot play certain roles in the church, and then tomorrow the Pope would say, oh, by the way, the church made a little error. Women can actually do this it suddenly questions the notion of infallibility, and I think that's a, a really profound moment mm -hmm. in this Khrushchev transformation. I mean, I, I think so too, in some sense, but I also think it's, a, it's one of those things where basically that, those couple of speeches, uh, the secret and the one to the builders, uh, don't fundamentally change anything. It's just like the secret speech sort of erases supposedly the tyrant from the Stalinist system without actually changing the system, the erasure of socialist realism from socialist realism doesn't actually change the system. So there's, I mean, I think there's a break uh, in, in a kind of reading of it and yet a kind of insurance that there is continuity because socialism is continuous just like you said. But, but there's there a kind of continuity within its logic. But there was a Stalinist purge of the architectural profession with yes. minor, minor consequences. So people didn't get into camps, but Khrushchev, to de-Stalinize architecture, conducted a kind of Stalinist purge. So in a sense, so that's a continuity. So what happens to Hop? Uh, Hop just glides right through. He's, he does mm -hmm. fine. But that's, a, that's mostly a Soviet phenomenon, the, mm -hmm. the purge of socialist realists from architecture. Mm -hmm. What were you saying? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add about the developmental um, thing that what was also at stake uh, with the um, these ideas of progressive development of architecture? It was what was interesting that it's parallel the ideas of the development of the development of society as such. And um, Stalin is reportedly have said to write, for example, that uh, I, I'm not against modernism. I just think that at our, at our stage of the development of economic base, we are not ready for it yet, but believe me, in 10 years, we will have modernism. So basically, we can think that what Khrushchev is doing, he is just arriving at, arriving at that point, and then there would be, the break would be not such radical. But, but, but who, who's the author of that? I mean, where do you know that statement from? Is that a quote from Wright? Well, yeah. yes. Okay, that's, that's, that's where, yeah. Yeah. okay, that's, now we got to the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just had a thought that I left me, but yeah, I actually, um, the thing about where we lost it. Uh, I wanted to maybe ask you, Greg, about the notion of beauty, because I think it appears in these different contexts differently. Uh, certainly in the Czech context, it's, there's 
synthesis, harmony, and things like that, then they extend beyond 54 and 56 mm -hmm. and to, as, to be, be the program no? aesthetically sometimes. Well, uh, for me, if you, if you want to look at Stalinist architecture of socialist realism, you have to take ideology seriously. Beauty is a part of ideology. The confusing thing for us is we have a word in our language called beauty, and it means certain things, and it's also pretty vague. Uh, and so that's a different thing. I mean, we have a word for eclecticism in the Stalinist vocabulary. There is uh, something called eclecticism, and it means something really different. So it's very confusing, and one has to go back to basic terms and try to develop a kind of culturally specific understanding of what that thing is. And I tried to basically give a little gloss about what yeah. beauty was. I mean, I want to open it to the audience, because I, I could keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. My question is for Greg and uh, Alan. Uh, both in the context of beauty and uh, popular mass enjoyment, recreation, there is a, a sense of reaching the people immediately. Um, but at the same time, I think there is still a sense of um, re-education <coughs> as comes out through the notion of beauty that doesn't come as an intuitive um, <coughs> creative process, but a rational creative process that allows you to reach this unmediated moment of beauty that will speak to the, to the working class. So I was wondering if there is if you see this ambiguity also in the recreational parks, Ala, and what is your take about this ambiguity in, uh, in Hope's work or his ideas of education? Is it a question for both of us? Or do you want to? Um, well, um, re education was not precisely what I was thinking about. So my take on it was getting away from the educational agenda. And yeah, I, I understand your challenge of my position, um, but I think that what they were doing in this particular example of public space uh, was just um, given um, a little space for people to, to do what they want when in the situation when they couldn't throughout the rest of their lives, basically. I mean, to do what they want within certain extents, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's a relief place, I think, yeah. I, 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 yeah, well, I don't, I don't I see saw any it educational actually, agenda there. I saw it related to, uh, well, I like the argument of the paper, you know, people are somehow, people's uh, daily life is somehow taken into account, actually, maybe even in a, your trajectory of the paper they won or they are winning uh, against the educational agenda. I also think there's an aspect to that like happiness and satisfaction of the masses at this particular point are proof that uh, the system works. And so I think that is actually really important. Just like we have arrived at the new way of life, or at least we finally need the new way of life because communism is imminent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't feel that, I mean, in ideological terms, I think there's fairly, that's, there's very little uh, that's unmediated in uh, socialist realist beauty. So you ba your uh, essential phrase, I think, comes from a kind of a Western understanding of beauty that you arrive at an unmediated moment. It's not that's how it's going to work because I mean, beauty becomes very heavy, uh, heavily ideologized. To get ideology wrong is like a, a fairly big problem. So you know, somebody could go in and say like, but you know, constructivism that's beautiful. No. Constructivism is absolutely not beautiful. So beautiful, uh, what the beautiful is, is very, very heavily mediated. But this is the point where you're, the point, the period that you're describing would be the period where Stalin is requesting all works to be socialist in content and yeah, national in form. Mm -hmm. And so national in form would have to be what is beautiful, yeah. whatever that is. Well, but uh, that's also one of the problems is that there's an ideology. It has to be socialist in beauty and national in form, uh, oh, whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. What is nationalist in form? And then architects are trying to, you know, come up with solutions. As you said, that they were trying to understand with the first park, what is it that was wanted from that program? 
and that's one of the problems. You have an ideology that demands very specific solutions, but as a creative, you don't know what they are yet, and so you're trying to invent what that is. Okay. Yeah. Can I just kind of follow no. up on that? Yeah. Um, uh, in some of the work that I'm trying to do in, in addressing these questions, like you know, as a producer, as an author, you don't know what to do. I mean, I've tried to come to the terms with the idea that ambiguity is structural, that this yes. is part, fundamentally part of the project, and until we can accept that possibility, we're going to be uh, reeling from the rapid shifts and instability of this kind of aesthetic, ideological regime. That's my footnote. Did Stalin use the park? Did he ever go? Was he taking photo ops? And the reason I'm saying this, the art head of state from 32 to 45, he's in a wheelchair. He's not walking anywhere. But he's followed by Truman, 45 to 52. He's walking everywhere. He's getting up and walking. He's, he's in, does that affect Stalin or he's in his dacha, he's in his Kremlin, he's not going anywhere in the public? Are the, are the Soviet uh, rulers walking around? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, Park of Culture and Dress was a very important place for, um, for establishing the connection between the power and the people. I was actually, the other part of my research that I was looking at is how do the rulers get this feedback <coughs> from, from the people? How do they know that the people actually want? And then Park of Culture and Dress was a very important space for that because there would be mass uh, processions, but not, not just processions, but uh, meetings of the people with writers, poets, intelligentsia, and also the party members uh, when uh, they would have open conversations about their life, yeah. Can I ask a, a follow-up question to that? Um, one, I think you raised a lot of really interesting issues, but I wonder what the uh, relationship between the park of culture and relaxation is to its other, you know, the non-ludic space of Red Square. The, of the, the highly formalized yeah. ritual public space. Right. And how, how do you yeah. negotiate that pair of you know, public events? Yeah, um, in first projects, I think it was even determined by the program that they have to be connected because they are quite near um, geographically. It's maybe like three kilometers or something. So initially there had to be a major, a main, like Stalin Alley in Berlin, mm -hmm. like big, very big fancy street connecting the two. That would also be a space for demonstrations from the Red Square mm -hmm. culminating in the Park of Culture and Dress, which um, eventually was not realized, yeah. but that was the idea. Yeah. We have time only for one more question, so. I have a question to Charles. Uh, the figure of Osterman, in a sense, uh, <coughs> unites together two strands of a revival of modernist architecture uh, during the Khrushchev thought. Uh, on one hand, the interest in standardization and mass housing. On the other hand, uh, the interest in uh, communal living and design spaces for communal living. And eventually, the latter uh, strand was suppressed. And <coughs> could you sort of speculate or how, do, how do you think what was the reason and the result of the suppression of this strand? Uh, yeah, it's. It, it doesn't need to be, you know, th there doesn't need to be that much speculation. Um, as, the, as the building was nearing completion, there was a set of sociological debates among, um, you know, sociologists about the, the project. And um, many people came to see it not as um, necessarily, well, basically as a, as a house with privileges. It was called the, the house in Russian, the house with um, collective services. They called it the house with privileges, meaning that, you know, although this might be a, a microcosm of a future vision, this is also a lot better than a average housing um, in in the rest of Moscow and the rest of the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, we 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 we, 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 we spoke we spoke we spoke before, but nobody wanted to live there. But uh, you spoke of overcrowding. If the units were perhaps not necessarily in such a scarcity. It might have been a different. Pro it might have been a different project. I, I think the only thing to know that people lived in that house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and the other panelists <laughs> lived in the in the house as well. <laughs> Human <laughs> subjects <laughs> research. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, on that note, <laughs> uh, we're going to wrap up and go to the wear lounge for.
uh, participants, uh, there is a lunch. Sixth floor, yeah. Now you can really talk. Now you can really yeah. talk, yeah.